Welcome. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the privilege of looking into your word this morning. Thank you that we can read it in public and indeed on the internet without any fear that anyone's going to complain or persecute us for doing so. And we thank you for that freedom, Lord, because we know that in many parts of the world it is not so. Those who have your word are persecuted and those who follow you find themselves hated by their neighbours who do not love you. Lord, this kind of persecution is beyond our comprehension. We, we've never known it, we don't understand it. But Lord, it's a living reality to many. And we pray for your blessing on our brothers and sisters. And we pray for your help and your encouragement as we read your word this morning, because we're reading about Daniel, a man who was surrounded by those who didn't believe in his God. And yet he remained faithful to you and was able to be a great witness for you. So, Lord, as we look into your word this morning, we pray that you will speak to us in our situations, encouraging us and helping us. Lord, we don't know entirely the problems that each other have, but thank you, Lord, that you do know. And we ask that you will minister to us for Jesus' sake. Amen. So let's read from the book of Daniel, chapter 2, verses 31 to 49. Daniel, chapter 2, and beginning at verse 31. You may recall the we looked at the first half last week, where Nebuchadnezzar had his dream and promptly forgot what it was, or wasn't saying what it was, and expected people to be able to tell him what the dream was and then tell him the interpretation. So reading from verse 31 of Daniel chapter 2. You saw, O king, and behold, a great image. This might, image, mighty and of exceeding brightness, stood before you, and its appearance was frightening. The head of this image was of fine gold its chest and arms and of silver, its middle and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly iron and partly of clay. As you looked, a stone was cut out by no human hand and struck the image on its feet of iron and clay and broke them in pieces. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver and the gold all together were broken in pieces and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away, so that not a trace of them could be found. But the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This was the dream. Now we will tell the king its interpretation. You, O king, the King of kings, to whom God of heaven has given the kingdom, the power, and the might, and the glory, and into whose hand he has given, wherever they dwell, the children of man, the beasts of the field, the birds of the heavens, making you rule over them all, you are the head of gold. Another kingdom inferior to you shall arise after you, and yet a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over all the earth. And there shall be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron, because iron breaks to pieces and shatters all things. And like iron that crushes, it shall crush all of these. And you saw the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay and partly of iron. It shall be a divided kingdom, but some of the firmness of iron shall be in it, just as you saw iron mixed with soft clay. And as the toes of the feet were partly iron and partly clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly brittle. As you saw the iron mixed with soft clay, so they will mix with one another in marriage but they will not hold together just as iron does not mix with clay. 
And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to other, another people. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever. Just as you saw that the stone was cut out from a mountain by no human hand, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what shall be after this. The dream is certain, and its interpretation sure. Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell upon his face and paid homage to Daniel, and commanded that an offering and incense be offered to him. The king answered and said to Daniel, Truly your God is God of gods, and Lord of kings, and revealer of mysteries, for you have been able to reveal this mystery. Then the king gave Daniel high honours and a great gift, many great gifts, and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon, the chief prefect over all the wise men of Babylon. Daniel made request and the king of the king, and he appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon. But Daniel remained in the king's court. Amen. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that this is a piece of history. We know it happened, and we know that the things that it records are true. And we ask, Lord, that as we consider those things this morning, you will show us the application of them to our own situation. For this piece of history wasn't just written so we know that it happened, but as the New Testament tells us, these things were written for our learning. So teach us, Lord, we pray. For Jesus' sake. Amen. So our subject this morning is that of hope, and the text is found in Daniel chapter 2 and verse 45, where Daniel says to the king, just as you saw that a stone was cut from a mountain by no human hand, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, a great God has made known to the king what shall be after this. The dream is certain, and its interpretation is sure. The dream is certain, and its interpretation is sure. Last week, we looked at the first half of the story. As uh, so you probably recall, the wise men were all condemned to death because when Nebuchadnezzar demanded that they should tell him his dream and then interpret the dream to them, not unnaturally they couldn't answer the question. They didn't know what the dream was. And the king was frustrated and threw all his royal rattles out of his pram and decided that all the wise men should be killed. And David, uh, Daniel was also condemned to death because he was one of the wise men, even though he hadn't actually been asked the question. So in chapter 2, verses 12 to 15, because of this, the king was very angry, was angry and very furious, and commanded that all the wise men of Babylon be destroyed. So the decree went out. And the wise men were about to be killed, and they sought Daniel and his companions to kill them. Then Daniel replied with prudence and discretion to Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, who had gone out to kill the wise men of Babylon. He declared to Arioch, the king's captain, why is the decree of the king so urgent? Then Ariok made the matter known to Daniel, not till then. And God revealed the thing to Daniel, told him what the dream was and told him what it meant. Verse 30. If you show the dream and its interpretation, you shall receive gifts and rewards and great honour. Therefore, show me the dream and its interpretation. That's what the king wanted and that's what Daniel was able to, able to do. So... He was fully informed. He told him exactly what his king was, this mighty image, and what all the various bits of the mighty image stood for. 
And the king did as he's promised. He promised great gifts and he gave great gifts. The king gave Daniel high honours, many great gifts, made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief prefect over all the wise men of Babylon. Great gifts, but also great prominence. And when you've got great prominence, you are then open to a lot of people taking pot shots at you because they don't like people who are higher up than they are. So Daniel was in a vulnerable condition. He was a man of God in a heathen court surrounded by idolaters and he was very important. And, well, the story goes on. We'll read it in due course as we go through the book. But it wasn't altogether a good thing to be prominent. Keeping your head down sometimes feels safer. But there we are. Daniel was prominent. But verse 47 is the important thing. Truly, the king answered and said to Daniel, truly your God is God of gods, Lord of kings and revealer of mysteries. Your God is God of gods, Lord of kings. This proud idolater who was so, so enraptured with his own gods who he thought had enabled him to overcome the gods of all the nations that he'd conquered, is suddenly realising that the God of Israel hasn't been conquered. The God of Israel actually is the God of his gods. And he is the Lord of this king, Nebuchadnezzar. He is beginning to understand not only God exists, but that he should be worshipped. It doesn't appear that Nebuchadnezzar did much about it at the time. Didn't make a lasting impression at this stage. But he's in the process. God is in process of bringing this heathen idolater to a knowledge of the truth. The dream itself is the first indication of world events that uh, were going to take place from the time of writing to the time when the Lord Jesus appeared as a baby at Bethlehem. Uh, there's a lot more detail in the later visions of the book, and we'll look at them as we go along. But just at the moment, we've got the, the outline. So, verse 30. The mystery has been revealed, not because of any wisdom that I have more than all the living, but in order that the interpretation may be made known to the king, that you may know the thoughts of your mind. God revealed it with the purpose that people should know what was coming. It was a huge encouragement to God's faithful people, including Daniel, that God was indeed God of gods, Lord of kings, and totally in charge of what was going on. Remember at the time, Israel was, um, had been overrun by the Chaldeans, the country was devastated. I'm not sure whether the temple was still standing at the moment, but very shortly, if it wasn't already, Jerusalem was going to be a ruin. Everything that pertained to the worship of God was going to be destroyed. And God's people in exile would be very discouraged by this, obviously. But here is encouragement. God is on the throne. And it's an encouragement to us in our generation too, because, you know, godliness is a low ebb in our country. Nobody takes much notice of him these days, but he is still on the throne. So let's have a look. Our text, verse 45. Just as you saw that the stone was cut from the mountain by no human hand, and it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, a great God has made known to the king what shall be after this. The dream is certain, and its interpretation sure. Our text tells us what we should be doing. God's people are despised in the world, and it's, it's that that I want to look at this evening. We're surrounded by hostile unbelievers. We find people are quite friendly if we conform to the uh, standards of the world, but we find that they are very aggressive. 
if we give any indication, any idea that their standards don't measure up, they're in fact sinful. Now, we're thousands of years later. This happened a long time before Jesus came. And most of what the dream meant, primarily meant, has happened. It's history. The various empires came and went. And during the rule of the last one, the Roman one, the stone, the kingdom of heaven, came. Everything God revealed happened, just as God said it would. And the kingdom of heaven is growing and spreading across the world. Just as certainly as the Medes and the Persians and the Greeks and the Romans came after Babylon. So we know that the kingdom of heaven will triumph. So it's hopeful. There is a lot of hope. The dream is certain. The interpretation is sure. So let's have a look at motivation, prayer and peace. Motivation, prayer and peace. As we've already noted, in terms of motivation, God is working in the life of Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar does get the message, verse 47. Truly, your God is a God of gods and Lord of kings. He's, he's getting there. He's understanding. But God is also working in our lives. And that's the point that I want to make this morning. How do we respond? to this piece of scripture. It's not just here so that we can read it and get a glow of satisfaction that our hero Daniel won and then forget about it. The four empires are matters of history. The, the solid history, you can read about it. We know about the, uh, the Babylonians and the Medes and the Persians and the Greeks and the Romans. You can read about them in history books. The beginning of the kingdom of heaven is a fact that can't be got round. We know it started during the times of the Romans, and it's still growing. But the point is, we are part of that kingdom. We are following Christ. We are following the, the rock, the stone that was cut out without human hands, that is spreading through the world. We're part of that work. So our text tells us what we should be doing. It broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold. That's what we should be doing. The Apostle Paul says something similar in his uh, letter to the Corinthians. Though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. The stone, the foundation that God laid, it wasn't laid by human hand, God laid it, 1 Corinthians uh, 3.11, for no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Or as Peter says, citing Isaiah, behold, I am laying a in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious. Whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Not be put to shame. Standing for God in the midst of a corrupt society, Standing for the truth, whilst everyone else is believing lies, and not ashamed. Pulling down strongholds. Dealing with lofty opinions, and there are some very lofty opinions around at the moment. That stone, both our foundation and the basis of our weaponry, we preach Christ. And it's mighty. It has divine power. All the plans of ungodly people, all the things that ungodly people take refuge in, they fall. Able to destroy strongholds, arguments, lofty opinions. Our text says they are broken by the stone. 
the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, the gold, all together were broken in pieces because and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. The wind carried them away. Now, if you think about it, you get a piece of an old flower pot and you bash it with a hammer, you bash it hard enough and long enough, you can reduce it to stuff which you can puff and it blows away and you don't know where it went. But try doing that to a piece of bronze. You bash a piece of bronze and you can keep bashing it for as long as you like and it still remains a piece of bronze. And you can bash away at a lump of silver too if you've got any old gold and it, it won't go anywhere. This is an act of God. It is God that turns things to dust, not us. We can't do it. Windborne dust is something that God makes out of the pride of this world. And Jesus is God. His word, his power, his gospel, coming into this world which seems so strong and so powerful and he can turn it to dust. So we have every encouragement here to preach Christ, to live so that Christ is seen in us, to be the light in our dark society, to be salt in the midst of all the corruption around us. In fact, to be like Daniel, faithful in the midst of huge pressure to conform to the standards of the evil society around us. It's not a forlorn hope. It's not wasted effort. It's actually mighty work. Mighty work for God. And you think about it. Gold. What is gold? Gold is money. Money is power. We're weak. We haven't got any money, not really. We haven't got any power, not really. But Jesus triumphs over the riches of this world, the gold and the silver. The word of God triumphs over that. And Jesus triumphs over the power, the might of this world, the bronze and the iron. You see, the world is united in ungodliness, but it lacks integrity, has no moral standard. It's like iron mixed with clay. It can't cling together. It doesn't know where it stands on moral issues. So verse 41, she saw the feet and toes, partly of potter's clay, partly of iron. It shall be a divided kingdom with some firmness of iron shall be in it than as you saw the iron mixed with soft clay. So in the world you get people who have good ideas and people who have bad ideas and they try to unite the two together and it doesn't work. There is no integrity. But we are united in Christ. Different denominations, different countries, different traditions, different ways of doing things, different characters, Totally diverse and yet united in Christ. The foundation is Christ. And the mountain fills the whole world. Held together by what holds the Godhead together? Love. Whichever way you look at it, we, in the Church of Jesus Christ, are in a wonderful position. All we have to do is to remain faithful to him. And if we remain faithful to him, he will triumph over the world around us. The opposition, the trials that we face, well, they are for our good. Hebrews uh, 12. In the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Therefore, lift up your drooping hands, and strengthen your weak knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may be not put out of joint but rather healed. Strive for peace with everyone and for holiness without which no one will see God. We have a great motive to stand firm. We have a great motive 
to be faithful. But we need, second point, prayer. Mm -hmm. You can't do it on your own. The world is a scary, scary place. Look, verse 31. O king, behold a great image. The image was mighty, of exceeding brightness, stood before you, and its appearance was frightening. Now, frankly, why would anyone be scared of a pile of iron topped by a pile of bronze, topped by a pile of silver, topped by a lump of gold? It's just a statue. But we are afraid of the power of the world. We are afraid of the iron that breaks in pieces and the bronze weaponry and the silver and gold money, the power of the world. It frightens us. Sheer quantity of opposition to God's word is very daunting. You, know, you just look in the newspapers or on television or whatever and try and find something where someone is telling the truth or saying something worth saying and it's very daunting. Quite disheartening. The destructive power of the world seems huge. And the power of the gospel seems weak in practical terms. The world seems to be winning. You, know, you look at films depicting stuff that happened 60, 70, 80 years ago. This appears to have been a Christian nation. Politicians mentioned God with approval. Not these days. The world seems to be winning. We need to pray. We need to pray and we need to see what's really going on. Remember back in the days of Elisha, way back in 2 Kings 6, 15 to 17. When the servant of the man of God rose early in the morning and went out, behold, an army with horses and chariots was all around the city. And the servant said, Alas, my master, what shall we do? And Elisha said, Do not be afraid, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Then Elisha prayed and said, O Lord, please open the, his eyes that he may see. So the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. Nothing can touch us unless God wants it to. And if God wants it to touch us, then it's for our good and his glory and we should rejoice in it. The first task is to see what God is doing. And of course, that means we've got to see it ourselves. It's so tempting to fight the world with its own weapons. You know, oh, we can't do anything. We haven't got money. We can't do anything. We don't have many people. We can't do anything. We don't have popular opinion on our side, and so on and so forth. It's the world that needs money and numbers and popular opinion in order to succeed. We don't. We have Christ. One with God is a majority. We can fight without any support except God. Therefore, pray. We tend to think of prayer as asking for stuff. So we fight the world saying, Lord, give me strength. Lord, give me this. Lord, give me the other. Well, sure, if there's a particular need, there's no reason why we shouldn't ask for it. Jesus did say, give us this day our daily bread and so forth. But really and truly, what we actually need is encouragement. And where do you get encouragement from? Well, look at all the prayers in the Bible. Look in the Psalms. Look at the prayers of the prophets. Most of the time, they didn't ask God for things. They just went over what God had already done. Speaking of the creation. Speaking of the way God called his people out of Egypt. Speaking of the way God delivered them from the Egyptians and the Red Sea and all the rest of it. Just go through. Count your many blessings, as the old hymn puts it. Just encourage yourself with what God has done. And by the time you've finished going over everything that God has done for you personally and in history, remembering and rejoicing in all the past blessings and all the kept promises, you'll be encouraged. 
The God who has brought you this far isn't going to give up on you now. You'll be encouraged. Trust him. But having said that, we're encouraged and we're trusting. We still need wisdom to know what to do. When to keep your head down and when to stand on the parapet and shout. When to be taking an opportunity and when to realise that what appears to be an opportunity is just a temptation. Yeah, it needs a lot of wisdom to know the difference. So we need to pray about it every time. Because when you've prayed about it every time, when the devil pops along a few minutes later and says, oh, you missed a good opportunity there, or, oh, you really shouldn't have said that, you can say, yes, I should. I prayed and the Lord guided me. Go. But if you don't pray, then when the devil comes along, we can get very, very distressed, worried about what we should or shouldn't have done. Great peace if we are yoked together with Jesus, praying about everything. Come to me, all who labour and are heavy laden, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, learn from me. I am gentle, lowly in heart. You will find rest to your souls, for my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Tackle everything in yoke with Jesus, i.e. pray about everything. And then, well, Philippians 4, verse 6, 7 tells us, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Notice it surpasses all understanding, even the magnificently careful understanding of your own heart. You look at your surroundings, you look at your problems, you look at everything which should be getting you down and you've got complete peace because you're trusting God. And you can't understand it. Why am I not worried? Because God is keeping his promises. So peace, our third point. As already mentioned, peace <coughs> comes from praying about everything. Well, back to the text, verse 45. Just as you saw that the stone was cut from the mountain by no human hand, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, great God has made this known to the king, uh, may know to the king what shall be after this. The dream is certain, its interpretation sure. The dream is certain. There is no doubt that the iron, the bronze, the silver, the gold, everything that this world trusts in will be scattered, destroyed, gone without trace. There is there's just nothing left of what the world trusts in. You know, you, you, you place your eternal hope on gold. You can't even take your bank book with you when you die, let alone take the money. Place all your hopes on power. Then catch coronavirus and you haven't got any power. You know, we are such vulnerable little creatures. There is absolutely zero doubt Jesus has the victory. Whatever gold, silver, bronze and iron gods think about it, However much they may shout and clang and declare they're great. How much do you know about the Babylonian Empire? Do you know what its borders were? Do you know what its gross annual income was? Do you know how many countries it included? Do you know where its capital was? Well, you should do it. It's Babylon. Clue in the name. But you know, we don't know much about it at all. It's gone. And the Persians, the Medes and the Persians. Well, that's a bit of architecture around. The Greeks, Alexander the Great. Alexander the who? You know, th these are just history. The Romans. But the Church of Jesus Christ started apparently with a few humble fishermen and a tax collector and so. That's grown. 
and it's growing fast. There are more Christians on earth today than at any other point in history. These empires that rule the world, nobody's ever heard of them. Vast areas of the world they hadn't heard of, but the church is there too. Churches spread across the Americas, which Romans hadn't heard of, and Australia, China. The world appears to be ruling everything. The church is persecuted heavily in many places. The church appears to be weak, but it is strong. As Jesus says in John 16, 33, in me, I've said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. Take heart, I have overcome the world. Simple, straightforward fact. In Isaiah 26 and verse 3, God says, You will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on you, because he trusts in you. Just trust God. Perfect peace. It's a promise. It's a fact. So if we find ourselves lacking wisdom, what to do? Pray. If we find ourselves lacking peace, pray. Confess lack of trust. Couldn't be clearer. God's word says Christ has the victory. God's word says in me you have peace. So we're lacking victory, lacking peace. We're clearly not believing God's word as we should. Now, of course, we don't live charmed lives. As we read on through the book of Daniel, which we shall do, God willing, in the future, he didn't not get persecuted. He didn't not suffer. But he triumphed through it. And we may well suffer persecution, as we know some of our brothers and sisters are suffering it even as we speak. We may be ill. We'll all grow old if we live long enough. It happens. And these things may not work out terribly well for us. Think of Daniel. He was a prince. Now he was a slave. Well, he's doing rather well as a slave. He's become chief prefect over all the stuff in Babylon. But he used to be a prince in his own country. Peace is not the result of knowing you are safe. You know, you can know you are safe and be completely without peace. <laughs> Put me in an aeroplane. I know I'm safe. The thing flies. But I don't have peace about it because I don't like heights. Peace is having complete trust in the one who has all things under control. If you really, truly, honestly trust God, you can have peace under all circumstances because there is nothing in your life that he hasn't put there and everything he has put there is for your good and his glory. So, there is hope. Bags of it. If we're lacking joy, Peace, hope, trust in the Lord. Mighty God, thank you for your word. Thank you for the encouragement of this history, which some of it we've seen happen, and some of it we're seeing happening all around us. Lord, help us to completely trust you, to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, our Saviour for eternity, and to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, our God, our King, for life at this time. Lord, thank you for your word. Bless it to us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.